I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 76 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 076. Last week, I experimented with a new recording method. I did not like the way that sounded. And part of the reason I experimented with that method is not only what I said in the episode, but partially because, well, I was in the process of reorganizing my recording studio, slash reloading room, slash gun room, slash extra bedroom. Yep. Anyhow, I'm going to I'm gonna change the order of the show just a little bit. I want to run the audio clip that tells you how to get the show. When we come back, I'll hit the carry tip, and I'll do a little bit of listener feedback. Until then... The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Now this week's carry tip, or actually this carry tip for the two-week period, is be a minute man or a minute woman. In the colonial era, militia men were required to equip and arm themselves for service. Minutemen were a part of the militia. Now, every able-bodied male, um, I believe it was ages 16 through 60, was required to be part of the militia. Consider the, consider the following as being the basics for being a modern citizen going about their daily business as a modern version of a minute man or a minute woman. You need to have a handgun preferably has a round in the chamber. You need at least one loaded spare magazine. You need a holster. You need a good belt. You need a pocket knife. And you need a license to carry. Now you may be wondering why these particular things and not something else. Something else is just an add-on. These are the basics to be ready to defend yourself in less than a minute. The handgun's kind of obvious. The loaded spare magazine can be a speed loader for your revolver if you carry a revolver. The holster, it's kind of obvious, it's to carry and protect your weapon. A good belt, I believe we have had a carry tip on a belt. If not, a good belt's probably the most important piece of carry kit that you can have. A pocket knife is always a good thing. And then I mentioned a license to carry. Part of that's because this podcast is focused at a Texas audience. Now someday, somebody may be listening to this episode say, well... You know, here in Texas, we don't have to have a license to carry, so why would he recommend that? Keep in mind, when this podcast is recorded, we have to have a license to carry. And on top of that, we currently don't have any viable legislation to remove that restriction. I think it'll take certain parties and certain groups growing up to where they don't make asses of themselves before we can get to the point where where we can pass legislation to remove the requirement for a license. But even even if we get rid of the requirement, it's still a good idea to have that license to carry because I don't know what the future legislation is going to be written like. Maybe a CHL or a license to carry or whatever it's going to be called in the future. Maybe that will get you access to places that not having one won't. Maybe, just maybe, you will need to go out of state. And you may be entering a state where you need a license to carry in order to carry the weapon that you need. Who knows? The truth of the matter is, I, while I may have a crystal ball, it's all cloudy. I don't get to see anything. Now, with that said, I'm going to run the audio clip. Well, no, I need to hit some listener feedback before I hit the social media clip. I've got two feedback points from listeners. Now, Steve wrote in. He emailed me basically... And I pass this on to our, I don't, she doesn't want me to identify her, so we're going to have to call her something else. And we're going to, we're actually going to play different names with her until we find one we like for her. I know she's probably cringing as she listens to this episode. However, I do have a volunteer that's working the news over. They're keeping an eye out for things that, and she, she goes through, she gets a lot of stuff and I pare it down. I've cut it back to six news items for this episode. And she kind of gave me like 20. I didn't want to cover all of it because I didn't want this episode to be all news. But anyways, 
Steve wrote us. He gave us a he gave us a few news articles, and our news girl. I don't know what we're going to call her for this episode. We'll just call her the news girl for this episode. We'll make up another name for her later in the show or in another episode. In fact, that's going to be kind of a gimmick we'll have. I think. I think we'll make up a new name for her every episode until she says we can share her name. And I'm not talking about sharing her full name, just her first name. But anyways, our news girl already had all but one of these stories, and the story that she didn't already have, we did roll into the into the mix. So, Steve, everything you emailed us was pretty much already considered. You'll know what is and is not uh, used. However, one of these epi- one of these news items you did submit to us, and nobody else did. With that said, we need to move on to let's see here, Douglas. Douglas emailed us. He basically complained he didn't like the way the last episode sounded. I don't blame him. And with that said, I think it's time to run the audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media. Then we'll come back. We'll hit the main topic, and then we'll uh, do some other audio clip. And then we'll come back. We'll hit the news segment, which our news girl has worked very hard on for me to cut back to under a third of what it actually is, or under a third of what she actually submitted. And then we'll call it an we'll call it an episode, maybe. Oops, wrong one. This is the right one. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google Plus, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options. Let's get social. Well, while I was playing that audio clip, I was debating whether or not if in the post-production I should delete where I accidentally started and then ended the contact audio and the oops, wrong one, this is the right one or whatever it was I said. You know what I decided? I want to leave it in there. Let you see that. Let you see how how many mistakes go on in an episode. I normally will edit out little things like that, mostly because I can write down where the time is in the original audio. I can just snip it out and then move on and delete it from the future too. Or not future, delete it out and then record. In this case, I'm leaving it in there. Now this episode, we're going to talk a lot about the upcoming open carry. Partially, this is because there's there's confusion over what, what is and is not happening with this open carry law. And this is going to be a long, boring topic. So I think we ought to go ahead and get started. Now, I'm, I do want to say before I actually get into the meat of this episode, please note that all the references to open carry and or Texas Penal Code Section 30.07 or 30.07 are for when it goes into effect on January 1st, which is about a month after this episode drops. Well, January 1st, 2016. Because I'm recording this on November 30th of 2015. And the episode will probably be released a little bit after midnight on no- on December 1st. Well, let's talk about something that's already being done. Let's talk about long guns and who can carry a long gun in Texas. Essentially, long guns are unregulated by Texas law. Anyone who can legally possess one can carry it. This means open carry, concealed carry, perfectly legal for a long gun without a license. Then it doesn't get any more complicated or simple than that. It just simply isn't regulated. Now, when you come to handguns, it's a whole different story. Anybody with a valid concealed handgun license or license to carry from issued by Texas or a state that has reciprocity that tex- or state that Texas gives reciprocity to can carry with that license. Right now, they can carry concealed. On January 1st, 2016, and after that, they can carry openly or concealed. Now, the requirements for a Texas concealed handgun license or license to carry are you have to be 21 years old unless you're a member or former member of the armed forces of the United States of America, and then you have to be at least 18. You must have a clean criminal history, including military service and recent juvenile records. Essentially, you cannot be a felon, you cannot be dishonorably discharged, and you cannot have a Class A or B misdemeanor in the last five years. 
You cannot be under a protective order. You cannot be chemically dependent. You cannot be of unsound mind, nor can you be delinquent in paying fines, fees, child support, etc. Essentially, any monies collected by the state of Texas, you cannot be delinquent on. You also have to be eligible to purchase a handgun by completing the NICS background check. Now, this last one really doesn't apply to members and former members of the Armed Forces of the United States of America. However, they must be able to purchase a long gun by completing a NICS check. Now, as I said, someone with a license from another state that Texas recognizes can carry in Texas. Now, not all the states that Texas recognizes a license from will recognize a Texas license. However, in the show notes, I'll throw in a complete list. Um, It'll probably say something like, for a complete and current list, please visit the Texas DPS website. Can't be any more complicated than that. You click on that and it'll uh, probably the visit the Texas DPS website or Texas DPS website will be the highlightable part. I may even throw the full link in where you can read it and click on it too. I don't know. I'll get to that when I do the show notes. So basically, to carry a handgun, and by handgun I mean a modern semi-auto or a revolver that uses a metallic cartridge, you have to have a license from Texas or a state that Texas recognizes the license from. Now, open carry Texas, come and take it. Open carry Tarrant County, uh, let's see. Texas carry a few other organizations have been carrying black powder revolvers. And this is kind of a legal minefield, but the pre-1899 and black powder firearms Uh, There's a general consensus that unlicensed open carry is legal for such handguns. Now, I don't recommend it without some clarification on the law from either the courts, the legislature, or the attorney general's office. The law that makes this the case is a little convoluted, and we're going to touch on that. I'm actually going to read you the penal code. The penal code is actually Texas Penal Code Section 46.01, subsection 3, which reads as, Firearm means any device... Designed, made, or adapted to expel a projectile through a barrel by using the energy generated from an explosion or burning substance or any device readily convertible to that use. Firearm does not include a firearm that may have as an integral part a folding knife blade or other characteristics of weapons made illegal by this chapter, and that is an antique or curio firearm manufactured before 1899 or a replica of an antique or curio firearm manufactured before 1899, but only if the replica does not use rimfire or centerfire ammunition. Now, this is a potential minefield, but should a prosecutor decide to test the prohibited feature requirement? The logic is, being a handgun is a prohibited feature. Therefore, a firearm that is a handgun is thought to be legal to openly carry or conceal carry without a license. Now, a handgun is a firearm, so is that a feature? Well, one judge may say no, one judge may say yes. One district attorney may say no, one district attorney may say yes. One county attorney may say yes, the other county attorney may say no. What does the attorney general think? I don't know. I'm not in a position to request an attorney general's opinion, although that seems to be the rage nowadays. So basically... The logic that being a handgun is a prohibited feature may or may not survive legal scrutiny. So until either this gets clarified in the legislature or in the courts with a viable precedent-setting case, hopefully by the Supreme Court of the state of Texas, or by an attorney general's opinion, which is the least desirable clarification we could get, until we get that clarification... Those who carry one of these firearms without a license is doing so at their own risk. The next thing we should consider is how can and should a firearm be carried? To be carried carried concealed, a handgun must be carried in a manner so that it's not openly discernible. That's the law in Texas. Now, to carry a handgun openly, it must be in a belt or shoulder holster. If you'll notice, concealed handguns don't have to be in a holster by law. That's weird. Now, the reason I bring up the whole... Concealed handguns don't have to be in a holster, but that's weird stuff. That's because they should always be carried in a holster, even when concealed. Long guns should be carried slung with a sling in a non-threatening manner, preferably over the back. Where can you carry? Well, or when can I carry? Well, you can carry right now. That's right. You can carry a long gun right now. If you got a concealed handgun license, you can carry right now. If you don't, 
you can go through the process, get your CHL, and as soon as you get it, you can carry. If you're waiting on it, when you get it, you can carry. Now, anybody that has a license as of January 1st or after January 1st, if they get their license then, once they have their license and January 1st is rolled around, you can carry concealed or you can carry openly. Basically, long guns right now, concealed handguns right now if you have a license, if not when you get a license, assuming you're eligible, and open carry as of January 1st if you have a license or after that date when you get a license, assuming you are eligible. Where can you carry? This is going to be a long, drawn-out segment, or part of this segment. We're not going to go into the why you can car- why you should carry, but we are going to go into where can you carry. In fact, we're going to instead of where can you carry, we're going to uh, go into where can you not carry. How about that? First off, we're going to we're going to go and touch on what's off limits to all firearms, not just open, concealed, or uh, long guns. We're going to talk about everything. And first off, I want to make a special note about TABC license premises. Case law in the past has defined premises for a TABC license location to be all real estate for that license location. If a TABC licensee is aware that you are carrying a firearm without a license, they are required to demand you take it off the premises. Now, if you are carrying with a concealed handgun, premises changes if you're carrying with a license. If you're legally carrying with a license on a TABC license premises, premises suddenly has the same definition or is actually the definition found in 46.035. Now, there's another special note I want to make. That's uh, per Texas Penal Code section 30.05. If you are given notice verbally with a sign or other written notice that you may not enter the premises with a firearm, then you may not do so. But... Texas Penal Code Section 30.05 does not apply to a person with a license to carry or a CHL or license from another state that Texas recognizes if the prohibition is based on the possession of a handgun. This kind of muddies the waters a little bit. If you're carrying unlicensed and you're told, hey, you cannot bring that into this property, you can't bring it in the property. Texas Penal Code Section 30.6 and 30.7 have verbal notice as being part of their uh, part of their methods of notification. So it doesn't matter if notice is given under 30.5, 30.6, or 30.7. If you're verbally told you cannot carry a firearm, you can't carry a firearm. We'll touch on 30.6 and 30.7 later. But 30.5, it doesn't matter if somebody puts up a gun buster, whether it's uh, printed where you have to have a microscope to read it, or if it's painted on the side of their building. If you're carrying with a license, that does not apply to you. If you're carrying without a license, meaning a long gun, probably a black powder weapon, or pre-1899, I'm going to say it probably will apply to you. Now, Texas Penal Code Section 46.03 defines off-limits locations for everybody as well. Now, in 46.03, premises is, well, we'll touch on that at the end. 46.03 sets a number of places off limits, including the premises of a school, educational institution, hmm, I wonder where the Houston Zoo got that idea, any grounds or building on which an activity sponsored by a school or education is being conducted, not where it will be or may be or can be, but is being conducted, or a passenger transportation vehicle of a school or educational institution unless pursuant to written regulations or written authorization of the institution. It also makes off-limits the premises of a polling place on the day of an election or while early voting is in progress, as well as on the premises of any government court or offices utilized by the court unless pursuant to written regulations or written authorization of the court. Some other locations are on the premises of a racetrack, in or into a secured area of an airport, within a thousand feet of the premises, the location of which is designated by the Texas Department of Criminal Justice as a place of execution under Article 43.19 Code of Criminal Procedure on a day that a sentence of death is set to be imposed or on the designated premises. Now, I do want to say that they have to post notice on, on that last one. 
And it is also important to note that the definition of premises used in Texas Penal Code Section 46.03 is actually the one found in Texas Penal Code Section 46.035, which reads as, Premises means a building or a portion of a building. The term does not include any public or private driveway, street, sidewalk, or walkway, parking lot, parking garage, or other parking area. Now that sounds pretty reasonable. Personally, I'd like to remove a number of these off-limits locations, but we have to deal with them as they currently sit. So let's take a look at some of the locations that are off-limits to concealed handguns as well. It's funny to note that these locations may or may not be off-limits to long guns. First off, all the locations that are off-limits that we've already mentioned are off-limits to concealed handguns. And Texas Penal Code Section 46.035 essentially says you cannot carry on the premises of a TABC licensed business which has been determined by the TABC to receive 51% or more of its income from the sale or service of alcoholic beverages for on-premises consumption. Now, there is a defense to prosecution if the proper and required 51% sign was not posted. It's also illegal to carry on the premises where a high school, college, or professional sporting event or interscholastic event is taking place unless the license holder is a participant in the event and the handgun is used in the event. It's also illegal to carry on the premises of a correctional facility. Now, keep in mind, premises is a building or a portion of a building. And we'll touch on why building or portion of a building is important in the new segment. Now, there are locations that are off limits to a concealed handgun license holder if notice is provided. And most of these will apply to open carry as well. Actually, all of these will apply to open carry, but we'll get on that in a moment. Notice must comply with Texas Penal Code Section 30.06 in order to provide the notice that's required to make these locations off limits. And these locations are found in Texas Penal Code Section 46.035. And they would be the premises of a hospital or nursing home slash facility. Right now it's nursing home and, or it may, I think it's, uh, House Bill 910, which is the open carry law, when it goes into effect, will change it to nursing facility. It may have already, it may have been part of another bill that passed. Now, if a license holder has written authorization, this one does not apply. An amusement park is off limits if written notification, or not written, if notification has been made, or notice has been provided. Let me put it that way. The premises of a church, synagogue, or other established place of worship. And... Any private property posting a valid sign that is compliant with Texas Penal Code Section 30.06. Now, all these locations except for private property are actually covered in Penal Code Section 46.035. The private property is actually the goal of 30.06, but you have to give notice under 30.06 for a hospital, nursing facility, amusement park, or a place of worship, as well as the meeting of a governmental entity. I don't know if I touched on that, but yeah, governmental entity meetings are off limits if properly, if proper notice has been provided. Now, I'd like to say that campus carry is not in effect yet, so we're not going to touch on what is and is not off limits under campus carry. We will probably touch on this at a a later date. I don't know for sure if we will. It depends on if there's people that want me to touch on it. If there are people that feel a need that it needs to be touched on, then we will. However, let's talk about what's off-limits to open carry. First off, everything we've talked about being off-limits previously is off-limits under the open carry law for the same conditions. Now, all the, condi- all the locations that are off-limits for concealed carry are still off-limits for open carry with a few exceptions. Now, the above locations that require notice under 30.06 or in 46.035 requires a 30.06 notice to be off-limits will be off-limits with open carry if the proper 30.07 sign is posted. Think about that. In order to ban firearms completely, they have to post a 30.06 and a 30.07. If they go through all that trouble, they really don't want you looking for a loophole. So don't go back to your car, put your uh, handguns up, and come back in with a long gun. Because if you do, they will probably find some way to charge you. Also, your black powder 
revolver. Yeah, I wouldn't exactly count on that being legal either. You might actually set the test case. We need to get clarification from the courts. Just saying. I don't recommend it. Let's get clarification unless you got deep pockets. I don't recommend trying to be the person that actually is the test case. Now, private property is off limits if the proper 30-07 sign is posted. Also, all campuses of higher education. This applies to the property, not just the premises. You may be wondering, why is that the case? I thought Campus Carry had already, I thought Campus Carry wasn't in effect already. It's not. But there was a provision in the Open Carry Bill to deal with the campus of higher education. And that's really where all your off-limits locations are at. Now, some people say, well, you didn't tell us why we should carry. You covered who, you covered why, when, you covered where, you covered how, but you haven't covered why. Well, that's not the subject of this episode. I'm going to run the audio clip that I started to run earlier, but I didn't. And then I'll come back and I'll hit the news. And I think we'll call our news girl, we'll call her Sarah for this episode. And we'll come back and see what Sarah has done in the news segment as I go through and uh, tell you what she felt was important that I felt was important enough to make the final cut. With that said, here's how to get in touch with me. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409 292 Six seven three six. All righty, I did have some listener feedback about the music in that segment. Said it sounded a little Jamaican and wanted to know if that was in support for legalization of marijuana. No, it's not. It was just an audio track that seemed to fit the pace that I was talking at. It was chosen for that reason and that reason alone. Anyhow, let's hit the news. Criminal actor defense of self and others. All right, well, we got a good one here. In, here in Texas, we had a purse snatching incident at a Walmart, and the behavior of one of the participants makes gun owners look bad. In a cell phone video, a group of people are seen attempting to restrain a suspect who manages to break free only to have a yet unidentified to the media a woman fire a warning shot over his head. The suspect is quickly recaptured, and the woman calmly walks away as the police arrive. The woman later contacted the police, and her actions are obviously being investigated. This one, uh, go to the show notes, gunrightsintexas.com slash 076, and go scroll down to the news. It'll be the first one in the news items. Read it, or not read it, but click on it. I believe the video is linked in there, so uh, watch the video. First off, when she fires that round, my first thought was she actually fired at him. She didn't. Watching the video carefully, it's obvious she fires just above his head. The problem is there's this thing called gravity. And when you fire something, it invariably, anytime you put something in flight or you put it, uh, you release it to fall or you release it when it's not sitting on something, it's naturally going to go down until it hits something to stop it. So when she fired the shot over his head, it went to a ballistic arc. It may have traveled up a little further, and then it eventually uh, traveled down. What stopped this bullet? We don't know. Was it stopped by a car? Was it stopped by a van? Was it stopped by a dog? Was it stopped by a person? Was it stopped by a building? We don't know. And this woman violated the four rules of gun safety when she fired this round because she didn't know her target and she didn't know what was behind it. You can't know what's behind your target if you don't know what it is. She didn't keep her finger out of the trigger guard until she was uh, ready to fire at her target. Her sights were not on target because she didn't know what her target was. Therefore, she couldn't put her finger in the trigger guard under the four rules. This woman created a huge liability for herself. On top of that, she didn't stick around for the police. It was only after her face got plastered in this video all over media where people were looking for her, that she came forward and approached the police and said, hey, I'm the one that fired that shot. And that's BS. She should not have walked away. She should have stuck around and faced the consequences of her actions right then and there. 
Although Open Carry Texas is probably putting together a campaign to help the hero of Walmart. After all, the bar shooting, they did, they put a, together a campaign to help that particular quote unquote hero. If you have a need to, a need to fire a weapon in a, pro, in a place where you're not legal to carry, you have a legal, uh, there's a, there's a legal defense called a necessity defense. And you have that to defend you if you had, if you had to, if you had to use that weapon to defend yourself or someone else. You have a necessity defense. But fleeing almost always makes a necessity defense pointless. When you flee, you're basically committing another crime and you're avoiding your necessity defense in the process. This woman did not help gun owners. This woman did not do any good whatsoever. Well, let's move on. Let's move on to politics. We've got three stories in politics, and we're going to touch on one that got a lot of media of attention, and I'm going to give you my position. There's a group of people, I want to say it's about a dozen maybe, that were protesting a mosque while they were open carrying long guns, and these folks seem to have stirred up a bit of a controversy. Now, one of them in a video, I believe it was, admitted that the protesters wanted to show force. Now, that statement right there means that he, and probably those associated with him, could suddenly be charged with disorderly conduct. If you wanted to show force, that probably meets the requirements for disorderly conduct. I'm just saying, this is not a good thing to do. Now, sadly, these folks who depend on their First Amendment rights to assemble, their First Amendment rights to protest, and their First Amendment rights for freedom of religion, freedom of religion, these same folks wish to deny those same First Amendment rights to those who worship from a different book. Here's the thing. Judaism worships a particular God. Christianity worships the same God as Judaism. However, we have extended upon that belief system. Now, I'm not Islamic. I have never had anything to do with Islam. But I understand that uh, Islam worships the same God as Christians, and they believe they have extended upon the Christian beliefs and mm, eh, corrected some of the Christian beliefs as well. Rather than being the son of God, they believe Jesus was a prophet. Go figure. However, we all worship one God. We all worship out of different books. Not all that are considered Christians worship out of the Bible by itself. There's the Book of Mormon, for example. And, you know, not all the Bibles are the same in the Christian re religions either. There's the new, uh, there's the new international standard, the King James, the new King James, the really, really new King James. I mean, seriously, you got more variants of the Bible than just about any other book. Trying to go and make a show of force and protest a religion isn't the way to keep terrorism out of your country. In fact, you probably helped radicalize people that were they were leaning one way or the other, and now they now they're thinking, well, these Christians want to kill me. They're out here. They're showing force. They're telling me I'm not welcome here, and that they will kill me. And that's not the Christian way. We don't want to convey that thought. That's not the American way. We don't want to convey that thought. And yet, these people went out there and they protested with long guns. You know what? If you want to protest, protest, but don't get your Pro uh, don't get your religious protest mixed in with my gun protest. Don't get my gun protest mixed in with your religious protest. It just makes it easier to keep the issue separate. You muddy the waters, and now you make everything a target for those who want to paint you as an ignorant hillbilly redneck. Okay, enough of that. I'm starting to rant a little too much. Now, our former Texas Attorney General, who is now known as Governor Abbott, made his official opinion. Uh, known in regards to what is considered off-limits locations in government buildings such as courthouses. Now, when you consider his past role as Attorney General and the similar political leanings of the current Attorney General, Ken Paxton, I suspect that the final opinion from the Attorney General's office will be quite similar to the one I'm posting a link to that Governor Abbott uh, basically gave the Attorney General's office. Now, the link goes to the Annoyed Man, a.k.a. Tam, from the Texas CHL Forum's website. And his website's WAM Productions or WAMPROD.net. W-H-A-M-P-R-O-D.net. Now, he's got a PDF in there. 
I'm going to provide a direct link to the PDF. If you need a website built, I can definitely tell you that the Annoyed Man is a good one to go to. I haven't really used him. I've seen his work. It's good work. I'm kind of, I kind of do websites like I do cars. I do most of my own work. Now, he did do a logo for a project I worked on for a little while. It was a great logo. The website kind of floundered. It took more effort to keep spam out than it than the project was worth. I'm sorry. However, in related news to the Attorney General and the Governor's opinion, a number of East Texas counties and cities are preparing for open carry and they're trying to determine what policies they can enforce and what locations they can make off limits to citizens who are choosing to open carry. I got news for them. If you cannot make it off limits to concealed carry, you cannot make it off limits to open carry. That's a good hint. But news links to all those stories are on the website. And now we're going to have two campus carry articles. And the first one's actually a campus carry article, while the second, well, the second one's kind of in the campus carry category because I thought it would be funny to put it there. You see, a student at Texas Tech University would have been, would have been a great, would have greatly benefited from campus carry if he was legal to carry because he was kidnapped and forced to drive the suspects in his own personal vehicle around the area. Now, the suspects displayed a firearm before forcing the victim to drive them around so that he could be forced to withdraw money from ATMs while they looked for another vehicle to steal. The suspects then forced the uh, victim, okay, they forced the victim to take them to Sneed Hall, which is a dorm, if I remember correctly. I used to go to Texas Tech. Never stayed in the dorms, but I think Sneed Hall is a dorm. In fact, I am so certain of it that I'm going to say I'm 99.99 certain that it's a dormitory or residence hall. Now, Sneed Hall is located on the Tech campus, and the victim was able to alert a second potential victim, which allowed him to start a struggle, and after a brief struggle, the suspects fled the building. I don't know how it is today, but when I was going to Tech, in order to get into the dorm, you had to have your campus ID, You would slide it. It would unlock the door if you were authorized to be there, and you could go on in. It tracked who went in, when they went in, and it tracked how long that door is open so they could know how many people, or not how many people, but if you brought, mm, if you brought extra people with you, you know, one might not be caught, two possibly might not get caught, but if you brought like three or four people in, they would know. And this is why they probably needed the student to let them into Sneed Hall. Now imagine if these people display a gun, he fakes compliance long enough that they hide their gun, then he draws his and he shoots them. Police show up, take the suspects to the the emergency room. Hopefully they live. The police take his gun, their gun, or guns. Uh, An investigation is conducted. He calls mom and dad, hey, I had to defend myself. I I, um, need another gun. Can y'all bring me another pistol? Mom and dad, sure, just go down to the gun store, use your Texas CHL, and get another. Campus carry would have helped that student a lot. Fortunately, he wasn't uh, shot or killed. Now, some folks might say, well, nobody was shot or killed, and that's the best way to go. But you don't know what these people intended to do. If he hadn't resisted, they might have shot and killed him so there'd be no witnesses. Criminals don't think like we do. We think like rational human beings. Criminals... Think like criminals. They're not rational, They're not, hu- and they're not really human either. They may be genetically human, but criminals are not really human. You see, with humans, you respect human rights. With criminals, you don't respect human rights. If you don't respect human rights, you're not a human. Just saying. I know I'm getting a little bit too much into the rant uh, category, so I'm going to do this last episode, or this last bit of news. I'll do my sign-off, and then we'll call it a show. How's that sound? Our last news item is about the newly discovered uh, campus where campus carry is outlawed at the Houston Zoo campus. You see, the Houston Zoo has replaced their improperly posted 30-06 signs, and they're now claiming to be an educational institution. I suspect that the TABC may have something to say about this because it's illegal to sell alcohol on an educational premises. And I also have very good reason to believe, namely... Someone posted to the Texas CHL forum that they were responsible for it, but I suspect that the TABC may have been made aware of 
the claims that the Houston Zoo is an educational premises and that they are selling alcohol on premises. Now, in other news, Logic has been removed from the Houston Zoo and is now considered an endangered species. Just saying. I'm not going to go into any more rants, but I would like to thank our news girl, Sarah. Well, that's what we're calling her for this episode. Next week, we may call her Mindy. We may call her uh, Tina. We may call her Lucy. I don't know. We'll come up with something next week for her. However, let me just say, I'm not going to do anything after after the music. So when the music ends, the episode's over. With that in mind, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.